we're home and we never lose at home. We never lose Capital University was one of several institutions around the nation to benefit from Title IX in the early 1970s. In 1971, women's intercollegiate athletics began at Capital, receiving separate status from the school's Women's Recreation Association. As interest for the programs improved, so did the need for support. Current head coaches Pam Briggs and Nan Payne were student athletes during the 1980s and saw firsthand the struggles that young women faced in athletics. The conditions were poor. We were shoved in a little gym. Um, we had our training apparel was one that lacked a lot of imagination, um, probably some old uniforms from another team. Um, the conditions in which we, tra we trained, the shoe quality, um, my body is a product of today. When we went in there, um, Bo Schembechler was the football coach at Michigan. and. When I first started, we did not have um, practice gear, so we wore our own things, and we looked kind of like the bad news bears. And I will never forget the practice that he came in and uh, asked why we weren't dressed alike or representing the university, and and uh, he did not even know that you know we didn't have it, so it was kind of just assumed, I think, by men's athletics. Through their work to build a comprehensive, competitive program at Capital, the value of women's athletics has dramatically improved. Again that never feeling like they're good enough attitude society has placed on these women my job is to say you are good enough you have accomplished great things and to give them some counseling well I, I definitely think being athletics um, especially as a female and in fact I was just talking to a player helps them with perseverance um, it helps them you know just fight in 1984 the Ohio Athletic Conference recognized women's varsity athletics Two years later, a promising young coach named Dixie Jeffers was hired to take over the Crusader women's basketball program. She entered Capital at a time where, nationally, the momentum for women's athletics was proliferating. It's about fairness, and it's about fairness whether you're a male or whether you're a female. And um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to evolve in athletics at the time things were changing. So for me, I've evolved with change, and I've been able to be part of the change, and I continue to want to be part of the change to be fair for our student athletes, whatever gender they are. Coach Jeffers' teams immediately became known for their fundamental play and overall toughness, winning three OAC titles and appearing in three NCAA tournaments in Jeffers' first six years. I actually equate what kind of team I have from the crowd, the crowd size every year. I know if there's a good crowd in there, I got a pretty good product that year. And it's become such a great spectator sport. Um, people really appreciate are we above the rim? No. Are we going to go and dunk and, and have this wonderful, unbelievable thing go? No. But what we are is a machine, a very fundamentally sound game of basketball. People don't understand the fight that we've all went through, but I was a person that didn't want to go and take a fight on. I was a person that wanted to produce a product that took care of the fight. And that's how I approach things, and that's how I've tried to teach young women that you don't need to go and make a scene. Just go and get it done, and good things will follow it. Jeffers Crusaders broke through in 1993, finishing as national runner-up. In 1994, Capital won its first ever NCAA championship and repeated the monumental feat one year later with a perfect 33-0 record. Well, outside of my husband being the first and best thing I've ever done, and then my kids, Jansen and Kara, were my second biggest accomplishment. I would say the national championships were because of how it impacted those people's lives, um, how it impacted the university's life, and how we looked forward of change. And I don't think you completely understand it till years afterwards, and you see how it still has walked with these kids in every phase of their life. And the one thing I probably gained from the national championship, not immediately, but years after, was how you need to pay forward. Seventeen years later, Jeffers continues her impact as head women's basketball coach, posting her 600th career win in January to add to her 19 combined conference regular season and tournament championships. In addition to coaching, Jeffers has embraced her role as assistant director of athletics. Her support and care for all female student-athletes at Capital is pure, 
genuine, and loving. One of the benefactors of Jeffers' support was women's soccer player Natalie Fiorelli. Fiorelli, a senior on the women's soccer team, began her career at Capital in 2008. Fiorelli suffered from symptoms of anorexia early in her career, forcing her to miss all but two games during her freshman season. After experiencing numerous physical, social, and emotional challenges, Fiorelli eventually overcame the illness, claiming a clean bill of health in the summer of 2011. In the fall, first-year coach Chris Coons suggested Fiorelli apply for a redshirt year with the NCAA. The odds were against her, as the games she appeared in as a freshman came too late during the season to normally qualify for a hardship. When I first met Chris, since he was new this year, he, he was just introducing himself and he suggested I could get a red shirt back. And the amount of work Don and Dixie did is just, it's beyond explanation. They put so much time and energy into it. After submitting paperwork, Fiorelli anxiously waited for nine months for a decision fielding questions from the NCAA intermittently through the period. The hard work put in by Fiorelli, Jeffers, and Director of Athletics Don Stewart finally came to fruition as a decision was made in February. We actually thought the whole time it probably wouldn't go my way, but uh, to our surprise, I got my red shirt and found out about a month and a half ago that I will be coming back next fall to play. The NCAA's decision was unparalleled, signifying a large step forward in recognizing the severity of anorexia and its related diseases in young women. I think with the unprecedented case that we put before them um, was argued so well in favor of Natalie and supported by documentation from the university, supported from documentation of letters written from doctors and Natalie herself. Um, this is an incredible young lady that continues to battle an unbelievable battle every day. But where she is now and where she was is night and day, and she's so thankful for the opportunity. She's thankful to the NCAA. I'm thankful to the NCAA for, uh, for understanding that this young lady should not be penalized for something that, that has been that difficult for her to battle. The work of Briggs, Payne, and Jeffers has helped mold the minds of young women for nearly a quarter century and has inspired the capital community. The women leading women has to be first and foremost in our movement forward. And so I want to get these women out there in front of other young girls, encourage their body image that we've talked about, encourage their desire to be special, and encourage their desire to excel academically and athletically and to make the most of what they can do. Being a student athlete at this level, you know, creates a great uh, work ethic that they have to you know, fight for things, they have to persevere through things. Um, they're created with challenges, but they're also unified as a family and coming together and helping each other. So, I mean, I've had many of my alumni come back and say they have, they have gotten to be very successful in, the, in the, just the aspect of being a part of a team and what they've had to endure. Well, you know, the pioneers, I, I appreciate the pioneers and, and the High Athletic Conference before I came in, and I'm a pioneer now, and I'm trying to continue to make things better for all.